our text this evening, Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Beloved, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 are closely related because they deal with the same subject. They deal with David's great sin and fall. And David's sin is well known to all of us, I expect. He lusted after Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And then he lay with her, and she became pregnant. And then he tried to hide or cover up his sin with all kinds of schemes, trying to get Uriah to sleep with his wife by making him drunk, and that did not work, until finally he had Uriah the Hittite put in the hottest place in the battle so that he killed Uriah the Hittite. And after months of David's impenitence, where he would not confess his sin, Nathan the prophet came to David and exposed him because of the sin of adultery and murder. And we all remember the scene. Nathan tells a parable about a man who steals the land of a poor man. And David is so outraged, he says, that man shall surely die. And then Nathan the prophet points right at David and says, Thou art the man. And David, in response, is deeply sorry for his sin and seeks the forgiveness of his God. And Psalm 51 tells us of what he said at that time. It's full of heart-rending words like these. Have mercy, wash me, purge me, blot out my sin. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, and so on. And in that desperate plea for forgiveness, David makes a vow. You can see that boy in Psalm 51, verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Psalm 32 now is the fulfillment of that vow. In Psalm 32, David is no longer pleading for forgiveness. David is now rejoicing in the experience of having been forgiven. And that's why we have a completely different tone in this psalm. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. <clears throat> now instead of pleading, he's teaching. He's teaching transgressors Jehovah's way. We know this that this is a teaching psalm because of that word in the title, a psalm of David Maskeel. And that word Maskeel means a didactic or a teaching poem or song. And in verse 8 of Psalm 22, we have the same root. I will instruct thee is the same root as Maskeel in the title. And so here we have David teaching us. The New Testament picks up on this reality in Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The psalms teach us. The psalms teach us about God. The Psalms teach us about our own sins. The Psalms teach us about the forgiveness of sins. The Psalms teach us about Jesus Christ. But the Psalms do not teach us abstractly, as a theology textbook would do. They teach us experientially. 
The doctrine and the teaching flows out of the experience of David himself. And that's why the Psalms are so personal. Because they come out of the experience of the child of God, of David, or of Asaph, or of one of the other Psalmists. David here is teaching us what he personally has experienced and learned. And now by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David teaches us the way of God with his sinning children. Because David had fallen into sin. He had experienced the chastisement of God. We'll see that, God willing, next time. And now he has experienced the blessedness of forgiveness which he has got from Jehovah God. And so we take for the theme of this short series on this psalm, Teaching Transgressors Jehovah's Ways. And the first thing that David learns, and the first thing therefore that he will teach us in this psalm, and the first thing the Holy Spirit will teach us through David in this psalm, is that true happiness is only to be found in the forgiveness of sins. Consider forgiveness Jehovah's greatest blessing, a wonderful blessing, an undeserved blessing, and a divinely bestowed blessing. Psalm 22 teaches us that there is one kind of person in the world, and only one kind of person, who is blessed or happy. People desire happiness, and many in this world claim that they have found happiness. And if you were to do a survey and ask, who are the happy people in the world? And what does happiness consist in? You would get various answers. Today, we live in a materialistic society, and people claim to find happiness in things. And the general rule is this, the more you have, the more happy you should be. And therefore, the rich are thought to be the happiest in society. They have lots of money. Therefore, they can buy with that money all kinds of pleasure. They have nice houses, they have fast cars, they enjoy good food, they go on exotic holidays, and so on. The more you have, the happier you should be, and the more you have, the more God must be blessing you. That's the idea that the world has. And because people generally find happiness in things, they tend to be envious of those who have more things than they do, and they tend to covet more things than they already have. And you will think, if you are fooled by this philosophy of life, that if you have few things, then God probably doesn't love you very much at all, if he loves you at all. Others who are less crassly materialistic will locate happiness in things which money cannot buy. You've probably heard the expression, health is wealth. Health is wealth. A man could be a millionaire, but not be healthy. If a man has his health, if a man has his health and his family's health, well that man surely he should be happy. Others will find happiness in their social life, in their family, or in their friends. Loneliness is misery, having a good marriage, having many children, having a good network of friends, there is the secret of happiness. And the best thing about these things is that a person who is relatively poor, financially so, can have many friends and can have many family members and have a good network of social life. And so the idea is, if you're healthy, you're blessed. If you're sick, you're cursed. If you've many friends, you're blessed. And if you are lonely, you are cursed. But David would not agree with that assessment of life. And by the inspiration of the Spirit, he explains to us 
that all these things might be good in and of themselves, but they are not the secret of true happiness. And one who has them, or even an abundance of them, is not necessarily blessed by God. The blessing, the only blessing, is the forgiveness of sins. Remember, David was the king of Israel. He had wealth. He had a palace in which he lived. He had riches and honor. He had rest from all of his enemies around about him, and yet he fell into sin. He does not say, blessed is the man whose coffers are full of gold. Blessed is the man who is king of Israel and has honor and power. Because what good are all of these things if you do not have the forgiveness of your sins? David knows, after having gone through the experience of Psalm 51, and now going, looking back and reflecting on his life, now writing Psalm 32, David knows the blessedness of the forgiveness of sins. He also knows what it's like to lose the blessedness of forgiveness of sins. He did not lose his salvation. We must be clear about that. But he did lose, for a time, the joy of his salvation. He became very miserable. He lost the comfortable sense of God's favor. We'll see that God willing next time. And looking back on all those months of misery, while he wallowed in his sins impenitently, David now understands more than he did before how blessed, how wonderful it is to experience the forgiveness of sin. And that explains how he begins Psalm 32. He begins with the great exclamation of joy. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Not only a confession, but an exclamation coming forth from a heart overflowing with emotion and joy. Here is a man who is filled with awe and wonder. He has received the forgiveness of sins. He says, as it were, God has forgiven me. David, a transgressor, a sinner, a man of guile and iniquity, a man who lived for months impenitently in my sin. I am blessed. I am happy. I want everyone to know how blessed it is to have the forgiveness of sins. I will write it down. I will give it to the chief musician. He will have the people of God sing it in all ages that I am blessed. And the man who has the same experience as I do, the forgiveness of sins, he and he alone is blessed. I was miserable, says David. God forgive me. Now I know there's nothing more precious in this world than to know the forgiveness of sins. When David writes blessed in verse 1 and in verse 2, he uses a word which can best be translated as happy. Happy. It's a word which describes the highest bliss. Now remember, there is a distinction to be made between blessedness and happiness. God's blessing is that effectual word of his favor, so that he bestows his favor upon his people. And in that sense, God's people are always blessed, unchangeably blessed. Never the objects of his curse, never the objects of his hatred. The blessedness, the blessing of God, does not depend, therefore, on us, on our circumstances, on how we feel. The blessing of God is God's attitude or disposition toward us, which is always the same, unchangeably the same. And therefore, in verses 3 and 4, which we look at next time, David, although he was miserable and experienced misery, he was blessed. 
God was blessing him. God was chastising him, and that was a blessing to him. God continued to love him, and God made him miserable so that he would confess his sin and receive the happiness of knowing the forgiveness of his sin. God was working all things, even chastisement, for his good and for his salvation. But for all that, in verses 3 and 4, David was not happy. Blessed, yes, happy, no. Happiness is the conscious experience of God's blessing. It's one thing to be blessed. It's another thing to know that you are blessed. Happiness comes through the joy and the peace and the assurance of the forgiveness of sins. And if a child does not know, a child of God does not know that he has the forgiveness of sins, even though objectively God has forgiven him his sins, does not lay them to his account, if the child of God does not know in his conscience he has that forgiveness of sins, he cannot be happy. You may only be happy about it if you know, if you are certain that God has forgiven your sins. If God in your own consciousness says to you, through the word of God, and you receive it by faith, I forgive you. I do not hold your sins against you. I will not treat you in light of your sins, no matter how terrible they are, because I forgive you. And David had that experience as he writes Psalm 32, and therefore he can say, Blessed, I am blessed, I am more than blessed, I am happy, I am blissfully happy, because I know the forgiveness of my sins. And this happiness surpasses all happiness known in the world. And David wants us to know that, and so David underlines that fact. He highlights it, he repeats it, he multiplies it. In English, if you wish to emphasize something in a sentence, there are various things that you can do. You can underline it. You can put it in all capital letters. You can put it into bold print. You can italicize it. You can't do that in Hebrew. But there are three ways in Hebrew in which you can make something emphatic. First, you can place it at the beginning of a sentence. For example, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin, is the English translation. Literally it is, my sin I acknowledge. And so he emphasizes his sin by putting it at the beginning of the sentence. Second, you can repeat it. Hebrew is well known for its repetition. Holy is God. No, no. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You are emphasizing it by repeating it. And third, you can multiply it. Literally, we read in our text, blessednesses, or even happinesses to the man whose transgression is forgiven. Per English, you can't say blessednesses or happinesses in English, but very expressive Hebrew. And so David is teaching us, and the Holy Spirit is teaching us, through the experience of David, that only the forgiven man is blessed. Only he is happy. Only he is supremely happy, supremely blessed. And so those who are not forgiven of their sins are not happy, are not blessed in any sense of the word. And we should not, therefore, envy them. They might say they have happiness, 
or contentment in their life. But God does not testify to them in their consciences that he has forgiven them their sins. In fact, God accuses them day and night through their conscience. Your sins I impute to you. I do not forgive you your sins. You are guilty before me. You are liable to punishment. And the wicked person knows that. And therefore, he does everything he can to suppress that knowledge and to silence his conscience because he knows that. And so there is no grace or blessing outside of Jesus Christ in whom there is the forgiveness of sins. God does not bless anyone who <coughs> sins he does not forgive because salvation is in essence the forgiveness of sins. That is the chief and the greatest of all the blessings of salvation. And this blessedness of the forgiven sinner is all the greater and all the more precious because it is seen against the dark background of sin. The world makes light of sin. And sometimes because we live in a world that makes light of sin, we become desensitized to sin. The world mocks sin, portrays it in a good light in its television programs and in its films. But sin is a dreadful and horrible reality. And David has come to know that by experience, how awful sin really is. And so dreadful is sin that David uses no fewer than four terms to describe it because not one single term can fully capture the horror of sin. Notice that in our text, the first word he uses is transgression. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. And that word transgression means rebellion. When a man transgresses, he crosses over a barrier. He trespasses. A boundary which God has set for him, he ignores. David crossed over the boundary of God's law, which said to him very clearly, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. David ignored those boundaries and stepped over them. And so transgression presupposes that there is a law. Romans 4 verse 15 says, Without law there is no transgression. A transgressor is a deliberate lawbreaker, one who willfully transgresses the law of God. And no one is able to escape the demands of God's law. David knew God's law because he was a child of God in the Old Testament. As the king, he had a copy of that law, which he was to read and meditate upon day and night. But we know that too. And so does the heathen man who's never heard the gospel of Christ. He knows the law of God too. In his heart, the work of the law has been written. In his conscience, he knows the difference between right and wrong. And the atheist in this country who says there is no law, there is no absolute standard of right and wrong, he knows that there is a law too. And his denial of the law does not change the fact that there is a law which he is commanded to keep. And transgression arises out of hatred for the lawgiver. The law is an expression of the holy character of God. And every transgression of the law is an attack upon the character of God. A personal insult to the lawgiver. And so when David transgressed God's law and broke the sixth and seventh commandments especially, he was saying this, I will not have Jehovah God rule over me. I will decide what I want to do. I will decide what is good for me. And what is good for me is that I have Bathsheba, 
even though I know fine well she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And what's good for me is that I try and cover up my previous sin by killing Uriah the Hittite, even though I know fine well that that is the sin of murder. So transgression. Secondly, sin. And sin is to miss or to miss the mark. It is to fail to live up to an approved standard or to fall short of a target. The idea is of an archer shooting at a target. But he's not someone who's trying <coughs> sincerely to hit the bullseye with his arrow. Rather someone who deliberately turns away from that target, he doesn't like that target, and aims in an opposite direction at a different target. That's what David did. The target is the glory of God. And all sin is to aim at a different target, which is the glory of man. So David said, I will not aim my life at the glory of Jehovah God. I will aim my life at what I want to do. And that was his sin. But God is jealous of his glory and therefore will not tolerate sin. In all things, God seeks his own glory. And men, who are but creatures of the dust, have the audacity to seek a different target and not to aim their life at the glory of God, but at their own pleasure, their own desire, promote their own glory. Forget about the glory of God, they say. Let's glorify ourselves. Transgression, sin, iniquity. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. The idea of iniquity is to be twisted or perverse. Remember the law of God is a righteous law. It is a straight and level, upright standard. And therefore we must so live our lives as to conform to the standard of God's law. But we have become perverted and twisted in our deeds, in our thoughts, and in our words. We in no way conform to that law. Our whole way is corrupt and twisted and wicked. We do not measure up to the plumb line of God's law which says to us, here's the level, here's the standard, live according to this, and we say, no, I will not. And therefore, iniquity is also guilt. Guilt which means liability to punishment. By committing adultery and murder, David committed two sins, both of which were capital offenses in Israel. And God was terribly displeased with David's sins. And in Psalm 51 verse 14, David says, Cleanse me of blood guiltiness. And in fact, when Nathan confronted David about his sin, David said, That man shall surely die. And so he pronounced the death sentence, as it were, upon himself. And fourth, David is guilty of guile. Blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no guile. There had been in the spirit of David much guile. And guile is deception or deceit. The man who is guilty of guile tries to cover up his sins, tries to hide them, and lies about them. He makes excuses for his sins. He explains them away. He minimizes his sins. And that's what we so often do. My sin is just a little sin. It's not a serious sin. It's not as bad as his sin or her sin. 
But don't measure yourself up against other people. Measure yourself against the law of God, and you will see that all of your sins are perverse in the sight of God. He made me do it. It wasn't my fault. And on and on we go with our excuses, which are only guile. And that was David, a man of much guile. When Bathsheba came to David and said, I am with child, David knew, my sin is going to be found out. I will try and find a way to cover my sin. I'll make Uriah the Hittite drunk so he sleeps with his own wife. And that did not work because Uriah was more righteous and honorable than David was. And then he schemed to have Uriah put to death and had his general Joah put Uriah, who was a faithful soldier, one of, we are told, of the mighty men of David's army, put him in the hottest part of the battle, and poor Uriah is carrying in his hand his own death warrant. And he's killed. He's killed by the enemy. But really, he's killed by David himself. He becomes the victim of David's guile. And so David is a man guilty of transgression, sin, iniquity, and guile. Now he says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Sin is so horrible. It requires at least four words to describe it. And there are more in the Bible than those four words. Forgiveness is so wonderful, it requires more than one term to describe it as well. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. That word forgiven means to carry or to lift up and therefore to carry away. The idea is of a heavy burden. A heavy burden of guilt the psalmist is not able to carry himself, which threatens to crush him under its weight. And now David says, God carried the burden away. I have been forgiven. And because I have been forgiven, I have relief. And my troubled soul has happiness again. Verse 1 says also that his sin is covered. The idea there is to cover over, to blot out. We have here the idea of sin being like a polluting stain, which spoils the appearance of a white cloth. You can think of man as he was originally in the Garden of Eden. He was dressed in righteousness. And then he fell into sin. And that white robe which he wore is now stained with an indelible mark. And no amount of scrubbing or cleaning will ever remove that mark. God says in Jeremiah 2, 22, For though thou wash thee with nitre, and that's a very powerful detergent, and take thee much soap, Yet thy iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. And so, those who have sinned are utterly filthy before God. There's not one square inch of that white cloth which remains white. It's entirely ruined. And Isaiah says, it's filthy rags. And God comes along and he covers up that stain. He blots out that stain. He no longer is able to see that stain with a view to punishing the one who has committed that sin. David tried to cover up his own sin, but that did not work. It only caused his sin to increase because he was guilty of guile. But God covered his sin. And God covers the sin so completely and so perfectly that that sin is never seen 
again. And God does not impute iniquity. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Here we have the idea of sin being a debt. A debt which is enormous in the sight of God and a debt which is steadily increasing day by day, moment by moment. And God is the judge. And he has perfect right to demand payment of that debt. But in forgiveness, God does not reckon that debt to our account. Here's David guilty of terrible sin. A huge pile of iniquity. And God opens the accounts in his judgment court. He looks at David's account and he says, There is no guilt in the account of this man. This man is not guilty. There are no crimes to his account. He has kept my law perfectly. Because God does not impute iniquity to David. He does not reckon iniquity to David's account. And therefore there is no punishment for David. Only blessing. Only blessedness. Only blessednesses plural. Only happiness. Happinesses plural. And David is happy. He's ecstatic with joy because God has not imputed his iniquity unto him. And that's part of the glory of God. When Moses asked to see the glory of God, part of that glory was this, that God forgives transgression, iniquity, and sin. We can add to that Gaia. But how can we be happy? How can we be truly happy unless we know how this is possible. How is it possible for God to take away that burden of guilt and carry it away? How is it possible for God to cover up that sin so he no longer looks upon it? How is it possible that God would not impute to us that iniquity? When God is just and God must demand payment, how is it Possible. Can he simply ignore the fact that David has said and say to David, Oh, you commit adultery and you murder someone, but that's okay. I'll forgive you. Let's forget about it. He can't do that because God is just. He can't say to David, I'll overlook what you did. Just try and do a better job in the future. You can't say to David either, well, you've done these terrible deeds, but if you do other better deeds, and they outweigh the bad deeds that you've done, then I will forgive you on the basis of the good deeds that you will do. David confesses here, he has forgiveness of sins. He does not confess here, he has any good works to his name. What works does he confess? Transgression, sin, iniquity, guile. Those are the only works which he is able to confess and they are not going to earn for him forgiveness of sins. They are those things which need to be forgiven. Notice here that David is completely passive in his salvation. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. He doesn't carry away the burden of his own sin. It's impossible for him to do that. Someone else does it. Blessed is the one whose sin is covered. He doesn't cover up his own sin. Someone else does it. And verse 2 tells us very clearly, the Lord. Jehovah God, he does not impute iniquity unto David. It's all the work of God. And this blessedness becomes David's. 
And this blessedness becomes ours because it has been purchased for us by another. And that one, we know from the rest of Scripture, is Jesus Christ himself. Jehovah God in the flesh. Christ took the load of David's transgressions. Christ carried that load on his back, as it were, all the way to the cross. And on the cross, he bore that load and he paid for all of those transgressions. Christ covered up all of the dreadful sins of David. He blotted them out in his own blood. And so they are gone, completely gone from the sight of God. What we owed, Jesus Christ paid. Christ took to his own account all of the sins, all of that iniquity and guilt, all of the crimes that David was guilty of, the murder and the adultery and all the months of guile, and every other sin that he ever committed in his entire life, and all our sins too, and all of them were accounted to Jesus Christ. He willingly said, Father, I will make myself responsible for the debts of all of my people. Punish me instead. And God did. And God then gave to us, to David, and to all of his people, he gave to us the perfect record of Jesus Christ. His perfect life, his sinless death, all of it is now imputed to us, our sins to him, and his righteousness to us. And we know this through the gospel of grace. This passage, beloved, is quoted in Romans 4. And Paul uses it there to prove the doctrine of justification by faith alone. To prove that the Old Testament, just as in the New, blessedness comes through the non-imputation of guilt and the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. David was forgiven and saved in exactly the same way as we are. And we hear through the gospel the same blessed good news. God does not hold our sins against us. God does not impute them to us. God forgives them, carries them away, covers them. And we have that assurance through faith in the gospel of Christ. And we are blessed. And we are happy. And we are supremely happy because this is the greatest happiness of all. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we confess with the psalmist of old that we are blessed, that we are happy because our sins have been forgiven, and our sins, which are so many, have been taken away by Jesus Christ. And we pray we might not seek the things of this world, which are but vanity. We might rejoice in this great truth, that our sins have been forgiven for the sake of Christ. Amen. 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 <clears throat>